Joining us now is Hubertus Mulhauser, who is the CEO of CNH Industrial. Welcome. Good morning. Nice to see you. Hi, Karen. Thanks for inviting me. Lots of plans for your company, including the separation plans for the business uh, and uh, separate listing of one of the entities, not to mention a new electric truck as well. Yes. Just talk us through some of the initiatives you have and what you think is going to deliver growth for investors. Yeah, we, we laid out a fairly um, interesting um, transformation plan for our company. So. Um, the, first, um, the first plan is to basically separate the businesses between the on and the off highway. Um, today we are the leaders in ag machinery, off high machinery and construction machinery. That will remain with CNH Industrial and we're going to spin off the on highway business under the brand of Iveco that you know very well and FPT. Uh, Fiat powertrain engines and um, I think what we're doing in that business right now you mentioned it we just announced a partnership with um, Nikola fuel cell trucks and we're actually the disruptor in the European and also global trucking industry with being the first with a fuel cell truck on the market. I saw the name and I thought it might be a Japanese company uh, the, tapping into the deep uh, auto background yeah. research in Japan but it's actually a US startup. Yeah, you know where Nikola, Nikola, Tesla's first name was Nikola so basically Nikola is the Tesla of the trucks and they're from Phoenix Arizona and um, I, I really think we, 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 we cracked the code of, of zero emissions and uh, it would be great if politicians would listen to that uh, sitting right now in Madrid yeah. because we're actually um, offering zero emission um, vehicles already now. Uh, we started that with liquefied natural gas trucks. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, and, and LNG trucks already provide for 15 to 20 percent CO2 reduction. And now moving into battery and fuel cell technology, we're supporting the shift, societal shift to the fuel cell economy, hydrogen economy. And actually, we're going to be at zero emissions um, in two years' time from now. So 2022, 23, you're going to see the first fuel cell trucks. Can we, can we just reprise some of what we discussed while Karen was at the wall? Because I think it's been fascinating for our audience. Um, very high profile launch of the Tesla truck. Slightly embarrassing on the glass, but we won't dwell on that. <laughs> yeah. But the messaging from Tesla appeared to be electric is the way forward for all vehicles, yeah. cars and trucks. You're talking LNG this morning. Does Europe have a Tesla beta in terms of uh, trucks and cars? Well, it's going to be a mix of solution. And, and one thing is clear. Um, battery powered electrification is going to be for sure for passenger cars and also for lighter commercial vehicle applications and for shorter distances. But if you think heavy duty, long haul distances, you just need um, um, more um, power density and the batteries today, the technology doesn't provide for that. So you need to have a different power source and a fuel cell is nothing else like an electric vehicle, but the source of the power comes from hydrogen in the fuel cell. Um, and that's the reason why electrification through fuel cells will be seen in heavy duty trucks. And by the way, Elon Musk and Tesla have nothing to offer on that one. They are fully on batteries, which I think maxes them out with their semi, but they will not have a, a you know, performing um, heavy duty truck as we have with Nikola and, and Iveco. And I think that's the big game changer for us and that's a good thing. And before you, uh, before you go next one, the reason why LNG is important is um, the whole gas infrastructure is a segue into a hydrogen infrastructure because hydrogen needs to be produced in quantities which it is not yet. Mm -hmm. LNG is there in quantities and we have an established grid in Europe. So if we start with LNG, we're already doing good for the environment and then at a later point in time we take these same pipelines and we just run through hydrogen as soon as we have built up the hydrogen capacity, which we do not have yet. So that's, it's more a capacity question rather than a technology question. And I think that is very important that politicians understand that and also support us in that shift because it is a societal shift to a hydrogen economy. You made a comment to us off camera as well that you don't think people appreciate just how far down the road OEMs are as well. I'll take you at that and take you at your word in that one. And, and I think there is a question about how we appreciate where the OEMs have got to from where they were. But are they there profitably? Because I'm just looking at the numbers from FCA and from Daimler and from all the other huge manufacturers who are looking at the transformation, the transition. And I wonder, and I have questions as do investors, about the profitability of that transformation. Well, I mean, let, let's not talk about the automotive. We're, we're, we're a capital goods manufacturer. For our, everything is total, goods, uh, total, total um, cost of, of, um, of ownership. To be fair, so you and mentioned the OEMs, not me. 
Yeah, I know, I know. And was, but I'm mentioning the OEMs in our I mean, heavy duty truck manufacturers, yeah. well, okay, uh, tractor manufacturers. Truck it's um, a sector which has been under a huge amount of com commercial pressure. Obviously, it has to be paid for. I mean, the, the, you know, the change, the societal shift to emission free doesn't come for free. It needs to be paid for. There needs to be appreciation in the customer environment. And there needs to be subsidies. I mean, if the politicians ask for emission reductions, they also have to help us for example, in establishing those grids, those supply grids. Um, they have to um, help us with subsidies that people have an incentive to go from a diesel to an electric or fuel cell or an LNG. Do you think Europe's largest economy could do more in terms of infrastructure spending to, uh, to get rid of its uh, fiscally neutral economic policy and actually spend more money doing exactly what yes, you just mentioned? Yes, absolutely, we have to. I mean, I think, I think that's clear. If you read this morning, the new CO2 uh, emissions have further increased on a lower pace, but they have further increased. If we really have serious about that, if we take Greta Thunberg serious, we have to do something and politicians have to do something and we have to redirect some of the funds. And what we are saying from the OEM sites, the technologies are ready. Uh, we just need to have the appropriate incentives for the end customers to buy. And I think that is important. And by the way, Karen, what I want to say, we have changed our revenue guidance. We have not changed our net income guidance. So we basically kept that stable. I want to ask you about consolidation because you've been somewhat critical about the landscape uh, and the move towards uh, environmentally friendly cars at this point. But one of the issues has been that some of the automakers are not really set up for the deep investments required. We are seeing uh, moves afoot to try and consolidate and create an auto champion in Europe, uh, Fiat Chrysler, PSA. Uh, you've got uh, links here to the Agnelli family with your company as well. What do you think is likely to happen? Do you think this uh, type should be allowed to progress and would that help the landscape in Europe? Well, again, I, I'm not here to talk on behalf of EXO, or on behalf of the United family, or on behalf of FCA. And we, again, we're not an automotive company. We are a heavy-duty truck manufacturer under Iveco brand. We're a tractor manufacturer. And we talk about consolidation there. I think consolidation is further going on in automotive, but also in the, in the on-highway heavy-duty truck space. And I do believe that with us coming together with Nikola, a startup, it is a first part of a consolidation. And with that, I think we're going to disrupt. And I do believe that there is more room for the commercial vehicle, you know, consolidation as well. I don't want to speak to the Agnelli family, but do you do know something about scale that's required with these types of yeah, investments? Of course you, need, you need to have you need to have scale because, again, in order to meet emission regulations going forward, you need to have a mix of different propulsion systems, and, and and that is a very very costly R and D investment. To your point, mm -hmm. and that can only be paid off in scale if you have the the, the rest of scale. But my other point was we also need politicians to support us on that. And by the way, last thing, we need free trade. <laughs> um, and which brings me neatly to my question, because we've managed to have a whole conversation about heavy trucks uh, without talking about China. Yeah. And I think, in reality, we need to bring China into this conversation, because it remains, I think, the preeminent market in terms of demand for these kind of vehicles. Could you just share with us your view on both the opportunity but also the risk of being engaged with China at this point while we still have issues like IP theft on the table? Well, okay, I mean, there's, there's several questions that you have. First of all, when it comes to emission regulations in China, I think China has moved to the forefront right now. Um, if you look at China and if you look at LNG, um, um, liquefied natural gas trucks. We only have 2% in Europe. China is already at 8 to 10%. They want to move this to 20% they, because they see that this is an interim technology. They're also investing heavily into battery powered electrification, fuel cell electrification. So I think they're doing the right stuff there. That's one thing. The other thing is, of course, the trade issues. Um, I really, really hope that we get at least a partial deal done between China and the US. It hurts our business right now, the absence of a deal, because soft commodity trade is significantly distorted because of that. And a large part of our business is agricultural, Case IH in New Holland, in North America. Those farmers right now, they're sitting in the dark. They don't basically know where their demand has gone from China. And it will not come back unless there is a trade deal. And what is also happening right now in the world is there has come to a, a very big standstill right now in soft commodity trading because the Brazilians are also standing on the sideline not buying equipment because they don't know what's going to happen in North America. So the longer this trade deal drags out or a partial trade deal on soft commodities that is not happening, the more uncertain the world is going to be, the more volatility we're going to see. So I can only hope that it was a bad joke yesterday when I heard that a, a deal should be cut after the next elections, which well, will be a nightmare. That's what, that's what the president's saying. Karen, I wanted to just bring you in on this, because is the sector um, uninvestable 
on a fundamental basis at the moment. I, uh, Hubertus makes some great points about where the technology is going, but at the moment, as you look at these companies, it almost feels like you're throwing a dart to figure out which one of them comes through as the preeminent automaker or, or provider of automotive solutions going forward. Yes, and, and again, I think it probably comes down to, you know, thinking about what's the end state and then who is best leading in, in reaching that end state because of course we're always going to still need these automobiles and we're, so it's just a question of who's, in, who's, who's embraced, who's going to be ahead of the game in that new world. When we talk about technology in the future for autos, whether that's cars or trucks, AI is very much part of that journey with self-driving cars. Yes. Uh, and what we know to date is many of the autos are not operating on a digital platform, let alone a number of digital platforms, whether those have been designed in China, United States, or right here in Europe. Where do you see the stumbling block if there isn't an accord with the Chinese, particularly around technology, and whether you could have silos that go up with trucks that don't talk to Chinese technology or, or American technology or talk to Chinese technology. Yeah, that, that is an issue. It is less so an issue in our segments. Again, agriculture, for example, if you think the digital revolution, precision farm and agriculture, we're right there. If you think autonomous driving um, in terms of tractors and combines, we're right there. All our equipment is already um, partially autonomous operating in the fields. You can put a child on a combine, a large combine harvester, and it will ride it automatically. So, so for us, it's less so an issue for us in agricultural, it's more the, the, the data sharing between the different manufacturers is less so an overall, an overall platform. And then on trucks, by the way, I think there's an interesting one. We all talk about automation of trucks and uh, self-driving trucks. In reality, that's going to be 8, 10, 12 years perhaps out. But us talking about that has led to a demise in available truck drivers because nobody wants to take their job. And I think later on you have a logistics provider which will tell you that uh, we basically don't find skilled drivers right now because everybody is talking that industry, that, that driver's industry down, which is, I think, also a very, very dangerous thing to do. It's funny how long it's taking, isn't it? All of this. I mean, we were, is, we've well, been discussing autonomous vehicles for a very long time now, and I just don't see anything commercial well, it's, on it's, the horizon. It's big data management for on highway, for off highway. It's a lot easier because if you are going with a tractor with five, six miles an hour, two miles an hour through a field, and there might be a little mm -hmm. rabbit hopping by, it's not too much data to process. That's the reason why you're going to see a lot more automation in off highway than you see in on highway when we go with 100 mm -hmm. miles an hour. Um, I think we're leaving it there. Very nice to speak okay. to you today, so very Pleasure. entertaining as well. Uh, Hubertus Mulhauser, who is the CEO of CNH Industrial.